Um, would it be okay if we got started? Sure. All right. So uh, I'd like to welcome everybody to the Pediatric Grand Rounds. Uh, before we get started, uh, I would like to remind folks to please log in to the Highmark system to log uh, attendance and also give feedback on this lecture series. And that helps us keep everything going CME wise, as well as hopefully in the future when we uh, gather again and eat food together. <laughs> uh, so today is, uh, is my honor to introduce Dr. Stephen Patrick. Uh, he's the director of the Vanderbilt Center for Child Health Policy and also the executive director of Firefly, which is a comprehensive treatment program for pregnant women with op opioid use disorder. Uh, he's an associate professor of pediatrics and health policy at Vanderbilt University School of Medicine and also an attending neonatologist at the Monroe Carroll uh, Children's Hospital of Vanderbilt. Uh, he serves as adjunct physician policy researcher at RAND Corporation and as guest researcher at the CDC. Uh, he's a graduate of the University of Florida, uh, Florida State University College of Medicine, and also the Harvard School of Public Health. Uh, Dr. Patrick uh, received his training in pediatrics, neonatology, and health services research uh, as a Robert Wood Johnson Foundation clinical scholar at the University of Michigan. So definitely an impressive uh, CV. Uh, he's, uh, he, his research involves uh, improving outcomes for opioid-exposed opioid infants and women with opioid use disorder, and also in evaluating the state and federal drug control policies. Uh, he served as senior science policy advisor to the White House Office of National Drug Control Policy. Uh, he's a member of the AAP Committee on Substance Use and Prevention, uh, as well as having been a voting member on several FDA advisory boards focused on opioid use in children. Uh, he's testified before the U.S. House of Representatives and the U.S. Senate regarding the opioid crisis uh, with pregnant women and infants. Uh, and he has numerous awards, including the AMA Foundation Excellence in Medicine Leadership Award, uh, the Nemours Child Health Services Research Award, and the Society for Pediatric Research Young Investigator Award, and the Gail and Ira Drupier Prize in Children's Health Research. Uh, he's published over 100 peer review articles, uh, including articles in JAMA, New England Journal of Medicine, the Journal of Pediatrics, and also Health Affairs. Uh, so, Dr. Patrick, thank you so much for talking to us today. Um, I will turn it over to you. Uh, it's an honor. And I wish, uh, like many things, I wish I could be there uh, in person. So I, I'm, I'm going to talk a, about improving systems that serve families affected by the opioid crisis. Uh, and I'm happy to, this could be more of a conversation to, I'll pause at various parts just to see if uh, there are things that we want to talk about, questions to talk through, because um, I know this is uh, a, a the, an area where we, we have a lot of um, uh, joint work um, uh, around opioid, uh, families affected by the opioid crisis. Um, first, I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. And then, of course, I will note that I'm talking right after uh, a, a football game. It was noted a little earlier that I'm a, I'm a Florida Gator at, at heart. Um, but I also grew up going to, to Johnson City. This is what I will always um, associate with Johnson City maybe not the 30th anniversary, but uh, so I was born in Bluefield, West Virginia, not too terribly far away, and my sister lived in Abington, and uh, I still have memories, uh, probably not the safest in the world, but uh, riding the back of the, uh, the pickup truck, my brother-in-law's pickup truck, to go see fireworks um, in Johnson City. Uh, that, that will always be uh, some of my, my, my fondest memories growing up, so uh, it's good to see you all. I wish we were able to see each other in person, um, and, and look forward to uh, hopefully what will be a, a discussion today. You know, for, for many of you, uh, just like me, the opioid crisis started like this, it started in the neonatal intensive care unit. I, you know, a few years ago when I was in training, we felt like we started seeing a lot more infants diagnosed with opioid withdrawal. And as you all know, it, it just, it really stands out in units that are full of infants on ECMO, on ventilators, Infants that have opioid withdrawal, they just present differently. They are fussy, irritable, they, present, they look well generally, um, and so they stand out. Um, that really began our team's work into understanding the scope of the opioid crisis um, and understanding how we could try to improve outcomes for pregnant women and infants. And, and that's what I'm gonna talk about today. I'm first gonna talk overall about substance use of pregnancy and treatment for pregnant women. We'll talk about neonatal opioid withdrawal syndrome, 
talk a, about some of our work on communities of trauma. Um, I thought it might be interesting to talk about some shifting child welfare uh, policies, both at the federal and now at the state level, and then Firefly, which is a program we just launched for pregnant women uh, with opioid use disorder and their infants. So let's get started, and we'll start kind of at the, at the, in the prenatal period. Well, substance use in pregnancy is not that uncommon. Uh, overall, about 8.5% of women use some illicit substances in pregnancy. What you can see, of course, is that that's less common than non-pregnant women. So pregnancy is a time when uh, women cut back on substances and are seeking treatment. The other thing that we oftentimes miss when we talk about the opioid crisis or substance use overall are legal substances. And you know, you don't have to go far in my children's hospital right up the elevator. You smell the smell of cigarette smoke in, in our community. Um, legal drugs like tobacco and alcohol are common. And of course, we know that alcohol is the number one preventable cause of developmental delay in children. And there, of course, there's, there's a lot of poly substance use too. And, and in many cases, I think we focus on one substance, um, whether that is opioids now or the emerging stimulant, uh, stimulant use in our communities um, without sort of stepping back and looking at the whole picture, including legal substances. Of course, we also know that younger women um, use substances at a higher rate um, it's more like 11% for younger women age 18 to 25 who are pregnant, still again, less than the general population. But of course, this is what we've seen in our communities. Um, we've seen first the rise of prescription opioids in our communities, followed by heroin and now synthetic opioids like fentanyl. Uh, some folks have described this as three waves. I've heard other folks as a three layer cake uh, where we have um, really all three still happening in many of our communities uh, across, uh, across our state and across the United States. Um, probably like you and our community and, and our county, Davidson County, it's really fentanyl that is, is really dwarfing uh, what, we, what we're seeing. So what do we do about this? And, and I just wanna take a minute to talk about buprenorphine and methadone. Um, these are the medications that are recommended to treat opioid use disorder in pregnancy. And so what do we know about that? We know that uh, treatment with buprenorphine and methadone decrease risk of overdose death, relapse, hepatitis C, and HIV. For the infant, they're more likely to go to term and have higher birth weights, but it does come with some risk of drug withdrawal. The way I often think about it is this, if you are a woman and you're injecting heroin, you're going through these rapid cycles of intoxication and withdrawal, intoxication and withdrawal. What these medications do is they level that out and they make recovery possible. Um, you know, I, I think one of the things that we often miss is this conversation of we focus so much on babies having drug withdrawal, we don't step back at the bigger picture of that too. There's a lot of opioid exposed infants who don't develop drug withdrawal. Um, in our center, uh, we only diagnose about 20% of opioid exposed infants with drug withdrawal. And most of the opioid exposed infants I see now are born preterm in the NICU. Um, the, the idea is that we treat infants, we treat moms with medication for opioid use disorder to prevent that really preterm infant who may not be mature enough to, to have signs of withdrawal. So we prevent that baby, let's say born in 25 weeks and trade off for a baby who's more mature at term with drug withdrawal. And that's a, that's a pretty good trade. The, the pretty good evidence to suggest these medications work. Um, and yet they're pretty hard to get, particularly if you're pregnant. This is an email I received a couple of years ago now um, about, uh, uh, someone reaching out. A mom had just delivered a baby. The baby didn't have drug withdrawal, um, but the mom, uh, mom was able to get some sort of treatment during pregnancy and now didn't have access to treatment. And what's interesting about this is that um, some insurance paid for the birth, um, whether that was private insurance or it was tin care. And yet the mom had difficulty getting into treatment. And, and why is that? Um, so our group recently did a large uh, randomized field experiment. This was a secret shopper field experiment to try to understand um, barriers to access to treatment for pregnant women when compared to women of reproductive age. Um, so what we did was we had trained actors um, and all in all, we, we had about 10,000 uh, simulated patients. These are actors that uh, called with a standardized script. Uh, they were either pregnant or non-pregnant, either had Medicaid or private insurance, and then they, they reflex to, to cash if their, their insurance wasn't accepted. This is kind of the gold standard of how we evaluate access to treatment. 
So to get the practitioner list, we went where, uh, where SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Administration says uh, you should go for access to treatment. We went to the buprenorphine treatment locator, and now it's a different iteration, which is findtreatment.gov. Um, so we, we, we got providers from this list from 10 different states um, in, the, in the US uh, that we varied, including Tennessee, that we, we chose based upon different uh, geography and based upon different levels of the opioid crisis affecting their population. So all in all, we had 10,000 simulated patients who called nearly 30,000 times. Um, among the simulated patients, 25% uh, weren't able to reach anyone on the phone. Again, this is from HHS's list of where you should access treatment. Um, never able to get somebody. About 20%, they were able to get a medical provider that didn't provide addiction treatment, suggesting that someone got waivered to prescribe buprenorphine, but they weren't actually doing it. And then a couple others where we got an inpatient facility or a business or jail um, instead of, uh, instead of a, a, a prescriber. About 3,400 simulated patients were able to get through. Um, and this was our randomization scheme. So you can see our randomization held up pretty good uh, between pregnant, non-pregnant, Medicaid, and private insurance and communities. So here's what we saw. We found that pregnant women had a harder time accessing uh, uh, treatment for opioid use disorder uh, than non-pregnant women overall. It's about 17%. So this is among people who got in and they either paid with their insurance or paid cash. Uh, pregnant women were less likely to get into treatment. Um, you can see that in Tennessee, uh, not a lot of distance here. You can see the error bars are almost overlapping between pregnant and non-pregnant women. We also call it opioid treatment programs. These are methadone clinics where we saw no difference really in uh, accepting pregnant women versus uh, versus uh, non-pregnant women. But of course, opioid treatment programs are far more rare. So for example, in, in the state of West Virginia, in my home state, there are only nine unique opioid treatment programs uh, when we started this. So that's one of the reasons for the very wide error bars. But the, com the conversation is a little bit more deep here too, and it has to do with insurance acceptance. Um, of people that were able to get through, both pregnant and non-pregnant women, there's a little bit of a difference, a little bit of a difference in terms of private insurance versus Medicaid. Here, overall, you can see that Medicaid was slightly less likely to be accepted. But the big deal is cash pay. Um, in many states, especially our state, um, it's cash pay or cash only pay was really common. Overall, it's about 25% of people, of people were only able to get an appointment if they agreed to pay cash, about a third when they call it opioid treatment programs. Um, and you can see uh, you can see how much this vary, varies in our state. Um, only about 20% of callers were able to get in uh, with their insurance in Tennessee for, uh, for buprenorphine providers, and even less, around 8%, um, with, with, uh, within opioid treatment programs. The other thing that happened was just the experiences people had when they called. So again, these were actors. And at one point, we actually paused the study because, uh, because um, because, because of the, the experiences callers were having, just a debrief. Um, here's some of the quotes. Uh, people usually don't show up for an appointment because they decide they wanna have one last hurrah before coming. Someone saying to a pregnant woman, absolutely not, I won't treat you. Another one saying, whoa, we don't do that here. I won't get into that mess again. Uh, and then someone else saying that, um, this is again on the first call that uh, if they don't follow they could, the protocol, they could, they could kill the baby. Um, this is the experiences people had, and imagine going through like you're your pregnant woman and you've gotten the courage to call for an appointment, and, and this is what you get on the other end of the phone, much less the, the barriers that are there to try to get through. Um, this, I think, it was pretty stark. So some implications here, of course, accessing treatment at outpatient buprenorphine providers in particular is difficult for all women. It's just worse if you're pregnant. I think one of the things that we need to explore are policies to enhance access. You know, why is it that pregnant women have a hard time or why is it that we have so much cash pay? Um, we, the government list for, for providers isn't accurate and uh, it really should be audited. There are some states that have policies in place. So West Virginia, for example, has a, has a policy in place that you have to take someone's insurance if they have it for, for treatment. Um, you know, I think we need to have a little bit more work and understanding if some of those policies are effective. Um, one thing that we've looked at as a group is there are some states that prioritize pregnant women to treatment. Uh, we looked to see if that made a difference in them being able to access treatment um, in this study, and it didn't appear um, that it did. So I'll pause and quickly just to see if anybody has any questions about um, treatment before I move on to talking about neonatal opioid withdrawal.
or about Vanderbilt football. Just kidding. Uh, don't even mention that. <laughs> uh, now, I had a question, like, what, what was going on with the jail? Like, why, why would jails be happening? So part of, part of what we found, so when we were doing the field experiment, uh, in some cases we got someone's office, sometimes we even got someone's cell phone. So it's whatever number somebody registered when they were wavered for, to be a buprenorphine prescriber. And so if you work at a jail, you may have used uh, the jail's phone number when you, when you registered. So that's the list. It is cell phones, it's jails, we've had, we, we called lawn companies. Uh, it's, it's a really interesting uh, list of folks. And, and I think that itself, like it's not, is not a reliable place for somebody to say, here, go get treatment. That, that is, that's, really, that's interesting. Yeah, imagine being, uh, getting a cell phone call uh, for someone trying to get treatment. Uh, I mean, right? I mean, it's, it's a, not, the, not the greatest setup. All right, so I'll move on to talking about opioid withdrawal and the question about nows versus NAS versus. So I, um, I'm going to talk. I'm going to. We're going to see these interchangeably. The, the the terminology is shifting a little bit, um, and I would say we've used we started to use neonatal opioid withdrawal syndrome just because I think it's a little bit clearer to the public. It is what um, various uh, federal agencies like FDA has used. Uh, in my opinion, it is. An opioid uh, exposure to an opioid usually plus another substance, but it, it's sort of its base is an opioid, uh, and neonatal opioid withdrawal is the is the uh, terminology that we use with the uh, American Academy of Pediatrics guidelines too. So what is it? Uh, it is a postnatal withdrawal syndrome experienced by some opioid exposed infants, and I think that some is important because I think a lot of the work that we do focuses so much on infants who have opioid withdrawal. Sometimes we forget the infants who are even a term who don't have withdrawal and don't connect them to services they would need. There are a lot of prenatal factors associated with the development and severity, uh, severity of, uh, of adverse outcomes, additional exposure. So our work, other folks' work, um, suggests that if uh, exposure to cigarettes, gabapentin, benzodiazepines, SSRIs, atypical antipsychotics, in addition to an opioid, increases the likelihood that you're gonna have drug withdrawal. Lack of access to treatment, I would say in our own system, we see uh, more complicated uh, neonatal hospital stays uh, when moms are not in treatment compared to in treatment. And certainly there could be some, some, some bias there because the, the treatment itself may come with, uh, with other things, uh, including stability. Postnatal factors associated with development and severity. It's a lack of standardization. We'll talk about that a little bit, but the literature suggests that um, standard practice improves uh, improves outcomes, including length of treatment and length of stay. Exclusion of mom. Um, there's now some pretty, there's emerging literature to suggest that rooming in decreases um, the severity of drug withdrawal. It uh, also not allowing breastfeeding. There are consensus guidelines for when you should allow breastfeeding. We talk about that too. Breastfeeding itself appears to uh, decrease um, the severity of drug withdrawal in infants. It's probably less about the medication transfer and more about bond, oxytocin, other things like that that happen um, in that setting. So what are the clinical features? I think about this as where the opioid receptors live. So common GI signs are poor feeding, vomiting, and loose stools that can lead to dehydration or weight gain. Common CNS signs include tremors, hypertonia, irritability, decreased sleep, that colicky baby times five that we described at the beginning, um, and then common autonomic signs like tachypnea, yawning, and dilated pupils. So what has happened with neonatal absence syndrome? Of course, this is, again, preaching to the choir a little bit. You all know what has happened recently in our communities with rates of, of infants diagnosed with drug withdrawal and maternal opioid-related diagnoses. But I'll share a little bit of data. Uh, this, is, this was done with some partners uh, at HHS uh, looking at uh, 47 states in the US. And what we've seen, of course, is a continued rise in infants diagnosed with drug withdrawal uh, and with moms with maternal opioid-related diagnoses. These are whether or not they had opioid use disorder and other overdose, other things like that um, during their pregnancy. Uh, we do see that there was a little bit of a shift um, in uh, our ability to detect pregnant women with the ICD-10 transition, but not so much with neonatal abstinence syndrome. Um, so there's a little bit of a detection change uh, with moms. This is what we've seen in communities. So this is uh, the darker the red, 
um, the, the higher the rate of neonatal abstinence syndrome. My home state of West Virginia has the highest rate, 5% uh, of births in the state um, uh, diagnosed with neonatal abstinence syndrome, which is an extraordinary amount. Um, well, we've seen a big increase in other states. This is the rate of change over the time period, 2010 to 2007. And even though we have some states like Oklahoma where they have a relatively low amounts, uh, we see a big in relative increase over time. And I think in some cases, it's that shock of the increase that we see um, that, that, that is challenging for, for many communities. I, I know it was for us. So how do we define neonatal abstinence syndrome? I think this is one of the challenges we see, you know, what is neonatal abstinence syndrome uh, at, at one hospital or sometimes even within one unit at a hospital is not the same as another unit at a hospital. And we really have no consensus or gold standard of what we're calling neonatal abstinence syndrome. Um, and I think that's true in state surveillance when we look from state to state and it's problematic in a couple of different ways. It's problematic for quality improvement. It's problematic for designing research. And it's problematic with comparing hospital to hospital outcomes. So one of our residents, now a, a, a hospital medicine fellow, um, uh, looked at our own data. So we uh, have, through our quality improvement efforts, have been collecting data on all opioid exposed infants for, uh, born at 35 weeks or greater, um, and looked at how, we looked at different definitions of neonatal abstinence syndrome. To, to understand the variability. Um, the common definitions that we use were any opioid exposure, so the whole universe, uh, Finnegan score of two eights uh, or a 12, uh, the common treatment threshold, treatment of morphine, a clinician diagnosis with neonatal opioid withdrawal, common surveillance definitions, either the one uh, in, that Tennessee uses or CTSC, these are the, um, the, the, uh, state ter the state epidemiologists, I'm forgetting the entire term, but it's basically the group of state epidemiologists that say this is how you could do surveillance. And here's what we found. Identification of infants ranged from 17% when we use just morphine use to 15, 53% if you use the diagnostic code for opioid exposure. Uh, and only 21% were diagnosed with drug withdrawal. So it's a pretty small amount. Like if we're looking, if we're using diagnostic codes, if we're using, if we treat it just with medications. And what's important is that some hospitals use these variations of either codes or only focus on infants who require pharmacotherapy. Um, and and we're, we're, we're kind of missing a large population. When we look at national estimates, it's likely that if we, if these results from our institution are applicable nationally, that we overestimate the number of infants who have drug withdrawal uh, by a little bit and wildly underestimate opioid exposed infants in our communities. Um, we really need a gold standard uh, definition for clinical identification management, research and surveillance. Um, and that's kind of the starting point. Uh, there have been some efforts recently from the US Department of Health and Human Services to try to standardize what we do. Um, they are just had a national convening a couple of months ago, but we still are lacking that. And hopefully sometime soon we'll have some standardization there. Uh, for treatment of drug withdrawal, what do we do? We work to control the withdrawal, minimizing complications like seizure. Um, and that starts with non-pharmacologic interventions. So controlling the environment, um, rooming in and breastfeeding, um, and making and tailoring the environment to the, to the needs of the infant. For severe withdrawal, it does require an opioid like morphine, methadone. Some institutions are now using buprenorphine too, um, slowly tapering that dose over a period of time. So what have we seen? So you know we mentioned a little bit about um, some of uh, some of the variability. We don't even have the same language in terms of comparing outcomes. But what are the innovations that we've seen? And I think there have been a couple. Um, so one is a shift on the scoring system. Uh, we've we've seen a big growth in the use of Eat Sleep Console. Um, most centers are still using a modification of the original Finnegan score. Um, if you all have experience with the Finnegan score, sometimes I'll put it up. It can be really subjective where uh, there are things that are, that are objective, like uh, temperature, but a lot of subjective things on vomiting or projectile vomiting that can, be, uh, that can lead to issues with iterator reliability. What's important is that none of these scales have been validated either, and they were designed in the 70s on, uh, on purely heroin-exposed infants with a median length of stay, and those studies were six days. And so we really do need some improvements in the way we score. So each sleep console is a pretty simple approach basically says, can they maybe eat? Can they sleep? Can we console them? Then they're probably okay. Um, what we've seen in the literature, and this is mostly from quality reports, is lower rates of treatment with morphine versus the modifi modification, uh, modified Finnegan. 
But I think it's a reasonable question, which is what is the right amount of morphine? I personally have concerns that I've seen some institutions talking about, hey, we're treating no infants with morphine, and, I, and I'm pretty sure that's not the right thing to do. Uh, whereas I know what we were doing just a few years ago, we were treating a lot of infants with morphine, we were probably over-treating. And so trying to find that sweet spot of treating, I think is important. This uh, ECI console is undergoing um, a trial right now, an NIH-funded trial. And so I think we'll get some data, hopefully in the next couple of years, about uh, its, uh, its effectiveness. Rooming in, um, there's some literature analysis for data from a meta-analysis that uh, when we allow rooming in for pregnant women, uh, we, they require less, infants require less pharmacotherapy and have a shorter length of stay. I, I certainly have seen this in my own clinical practice. The way our unit is set up, we have part of our high acuity unit where there's no rooming in. Uh, and then we have another part of our unit that we oftentimes will use just before discharge where moms can room in. Um, when we were still taking care of opioid exposed infants in the unit, a couple of years ago, I had a mom who was, uh, or had a baby who was on morphine, clonidine, and phenobarbital. Uh, it was still, I think, I think four weeks into the stay at that time. And I transferred that baby over to where mom could room in, and we just started peeling off medications because that mom was there with that baby consistently uh, holding the infant and, uh, and uh, consoling the infant. And I think some of what we do and just our processes of care, we exacerbate that underlying withdrawal. Um, there's uh, pretty good evidence now that longer acting opioids like methadone and buprenorphine reduce length of stay. There are two randomized controlled trial uh, trials of buprenorphine and methadone um, that are associated with shorter length of stay. You can still see these are, these are reasonably long lengths of stay. Um, I think that buprenorphine is particularly interesting because they found a difference in between this compared to morphine and even uh, the respiratory rate was different. Um, I still believe that one of the things that, uh, that matters more than the medication you cho choose is the process of care. Um, I think probably makes a bigger difference than that, than, than the medication that you choose. And I think that's built upon this, which is the standardized process that, that, we, uh, that we do. Um, one of my favorite examples of this is the Ohio Perinatal Collaborative. They started to do some work using their perinatal collaborative to look at what works better, morphine or methadone for treatment of withdrawal. Um, they found no effect by the medication in that study, but what they did find was a big effect by hospitals who standardized their treatments. It's about half the length of treatment versus uh, centers who didn't uh, standardize the way they treated infants. Uh, similarly, um, we uh, for the Vermont Oxford Network, this was a collaboration of nearly 200 hospitals, mostly in the US, but also Canada, uh, where uh, it was a two-year collaborative where hospitals increasingly standardized what they were doing. Um, this was also associated with short length of treatment, length of stay. Um, uh, and this was particularly true when the hospitals uh, standardized the way they scored infants. So I think standardization really does matter. We, we see this in other parts of our practice too, of course, like we know in the NICU feeding protocols uh, up here to decrease uh, necrotizing intercolitis. So Protocols do, do matter, um, particularly when we're in this space of what is the exact right medication, what is the exact right process. Sometimes just being consistent with, with what you do is not only less confusing for families, but also improves outcomes. So analysis increased substantially over the last two decades. It may be plateauing. I, there are there's some literature just before COVID-19 that suggests it was. I'm pretty worried that uh, things have gotten worse uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. You know, we saw again a record number of overdose deaths last year in Tennessee, a big increase in overdose deaths. So I don't know what this is gonna look like when the dust settles in terms of data. I do think there's an urgent need for us to standardize how we diagnose uh, neonatal opioid withdrawal because I, it's really hard to advance the science and advance our quality improvement efforts before we do that. I think a focus exclusively on nows may miss most opioid exposed infants, and I think that's potentially problematic. Uh, there's a study out of Texas a few years ago, I actually think it was done by folks at Dartmouth, but it used data from Texas that found some of the highest risk for opioid related complications were the infants that were opioid exposed but not diagnosed with drug withdrawal. And it might be that um, you know, infants with drug withdrawal qualify for certain services or are watched differently. Um, and so I, I think that's one of the reasons why we need to step back um, and, and what we're doing. Uh, standardizing care, rooming in, uh, really does improve outcomes. Um, any questions before I move on to talking about communities? Short caffeine break. 
Okay, let's talk about communities. Dr. Patrick, hey, yes. sorry. Hey, yeah, no um, I'm Lauren Swift. I'm a hospitalist here. Um, and you may have said this, and I might have missed it. Where do you take care of these patients? Are they on the NICU service or are they on the hospitalist service? They are not in the NICU, and I will totally talk about that. I was going to okay. I'll talk about, no, no worries. I'll talk about kind of how we shifted care um, and, in my last little section here, if that's all right. Wonderful, because we're getting ready to do that too. So I'm in. Oh, great. Thank you. Yeah, of course. All right, let's talk about communities. So um, just before the pandemic, this is my, this is my hometown in, in Bluefield. Um, this was, you know, Friday afternoon um, downtown. And this is what things look like now. Um, you know, the population in Bluefield has dropped uh, uh, by about half since 1960. Um, jobs that were available for are not available. You know, my grandfather didn't have a high school education, but he had a job on the railroad. Um, a lot of those jobs just don't exist anymore. And what we see in Mercer County is, you know, a rate of overdose death that is three times the national average. And again, um, depending upon the statistics you see, somewhere between three and a half and five percent of the infants born here having having drug withdrawal. And um, you know, I think the question becomes like, what is the role of the community? What's happening in the community that may complicate this? Yes, for sure. If we look at um, other parts, so like look at Kermit, West Virginia, where opioids were just poured in um, by um, by pharmaceutical companies. Clearly, that's what started this. But I think our communities. Uh, the lack of economic opportunity, uh, some of the shifts have maybe added some fuel to the fire. For many of you, you probably were familiar with some of the work of Case and Deaton. Uh, these are uh, economists who coined the term deaths of despair. They actually have a book out uh, that came out last year um, called Deaths of Despair that I would, I would recommend. Um, it's, it's a pretty good read, even for a non-economist. Um, so the, the big part of what they looked at were what is the role of economies, education, other factors, and deaths from overdose, suicide, and alcohol-related deaths. Um, and you know, part of what we wondered was, is this also happening for maternal child health? We know that opioid-related complications have occurred disproportionately in, in impoverished and rural settings, and rural counties in particular may be at risk for opioid-related complications. Access to healthcare, we've certainly seen our share of rural hospital closures, lack of economic opportunity, and you know, what some of the work of Case and Teton even looks at what is the change of, um, of, of the structure of communities and how, that, uh, and how that affects the way people are interconnected over time? And COVID's probably just made that harder. So this is a paper we published a couple of years ago, I think early 2019, um, looking at data from 580 US counties, um, trying to look at economic factors, clinician supply, rurality with the diagnosis of drug withdrawal and in infants. And I'm gonna mostly focus here on economic factors. This isn't going to be a surprise to any one of you here. Uh, this is a, I'm going to even though you can see in the bottom left hand corner the, the counties that we focused on uh, in the study, uh, I'm going to focus on the, the where we live uh, in, uh, in 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 our in our states. And um, the darker the blue, of course, the higher the rate of drug withdrawal and newborns. And of course, you can see uh, this spread throughout throughout Appalachia in particular, um, like any epidemic would. But here's when we overlay this with long-term unemployment. For this study, we wanted to know what was happening in terms of employment in that county, not just today, but for the last decade. So we looked at a moving average of uh, long-term unemployment. And so here, the darker purple in this, in this key, the bottom right, are counties that have high rates of long-term unemployment and have high rates of neonatal abstinence syndrome. And again, you can see disproportionately they are in uh, rural areas and, and Appalachia. Um, and uh, one of the things that I find also interesting is it's not just that uh, you, know, you see state, you see areas that also have uh, high rates of neonatal abstinence syndrome, but have, uh, I'm sorry, high rates of, of unemployment, but low rates of neonatal abstinence syndrome. And I think we have something to learn from those communities too. It's not just about some of the negative things, but also the resiliency of some communities too. So overall in our study period, we found that the 10 year moving average of unemployment grew from 6.5 to 8.2%. And this of course was during the period of the great uh, Great Recession. Um, this is also associated with higher rates of neonatal absence syndrome after accounting for other factors, particularly in remote rural communities. So we found about every two percentage point increase 
and long-term unemployment was associated with a 34% higher rate of neonatal abstinence syndrome. So it's not just the, not just the opioid, but also what's happening in the community that appears to matter. We also found that communities with a shortage of mental health providers were associated with higher rates of neonatal abstinence syndrome. But importantly, there is so much of a shortage in, in I think, in, our, in the data. 80% um, of county, urban counties have, were mental health shortage areas, 90% in rural counties. So it's, it's almost silly because uh, there's such a shortage and such a need for uh, mental health providers uh, in, in these communities. Uh, just as, a, as, a, as an aside, you, you can find these data on our website. If you go to childpolicy.org forward slash NAS, we also have other data visualizations there too. You can play with, um, uh, here's Alachua County, go Gators. Um, but uh, you can play with uh, the findings. You can adjust like what would be the effect in various counties uh, if, you, if you changed the uh, unemployment rate, for example. You can also pull out the data for NAS by state um, and, and that's there. Okay, so moving ahead, and then we'll, we'll leave some time for some of the discussion about uh, care processes too, um, to after we leave the NICU. And I think it's important for us to know, as we think about long-term outcomes, that maternal drug use doesn't occur in isolation. It often occurs with poor health, poor nutrition, like food insecurity, poor prenatal care, social stress, as well as violence. Each of these can affect obstetric outcomes, um, and some of this instability can affect developmental outcomes too. Um, and I, and I think when I look personally, when I look at some of the development literature, a lot of things aren't accounted for. This level of confounding. The other thing that's oftentimes not accounted for is the effect of alcohol. Uh, we know from some of our work that um, there's a really high rate of alcohol use with opioid misuse. And I think sometimes we, you know, we think about the effect of the opioid. Um, what we're missing is the effect of the environment, the effect of mom's health, as well as alcohol on some long-term outcomes. We also know that trauma and toxic stress is really common. If you look at some of the literature of women who make it into treatments, three quarters re re report um, sexual abuse, a similar emotional abuse, about half physical abuse. <clears throat> Looking at some of the ACEs literature, adverse childhood experiences are really common. Adults with greater than five ACEs compared to zero are eight times as likely to have a life lifetime sub substance dependence and 10 times as likely uh, to have injected drugs. Um, so there's this complexity of what we see. It's not just about the opioid. Uh, it's not just about the community, but it's also about these uh, stresses. So I think all these things matter. And I think the systems we design, uh, public health systems, need to uh, be mindful of them. All right, just a, a, a quick note about child welfare changes. And I'm sure in your community, like our community, the child welfare system has been stressed, certainly uh, by the rise of the opioid crisis. Um, these are some data of, uh, of foster care placements just among infants in the U.S., how it looked in 2011 and now in 2017. These are the most recent data we had available. Again, my home state of West Virginia, uh, more than 4% of infants are in the foster care system. And overall, between 2010, excuse me, 2011 and 2017, there was an increase of nearly 10,000 kids, uh, infants in the foster care system. And so to put another way, um, in 2017, sorry, 2011, I'm really struggling with years, 2011, there were 40,000 infants in the U.S. foster system and 50,000 in 2017, an increase of about 25%. Most of that is due to parental substance use. Um, and and, and I, again, we're starting to see um, many child welfare systems really struggle. But we've seen a lot of movement federally uh, and legislation related to child welfare. The first that I'll mention is the Comprehensive Addiction Recovery Act uh, that modified the Child Abuse Prevention Treatment Act, CAPTA, um, that required a, uh, that infants born with and identified as affected by substance abuse, this is the language, that a plan of safe care needed to be, to be uh, crafted. Uh, and that what was important about this is that it not only addressed the needs of the infant, but also the caregiver, including the needs of the caregiver's treatment. Um, it required states to develop plans to monitor implementation of plans of safe care. Um, one of the challenging spaces here, as you guys have probably experienced, what does it mean to be born affected by substance abuse? Um, the term affected by really doesn't have a lot of clinical meaning. And therefore, it can be really broad in, in, in what it means, and different states have interpreted this differently. We've also seen um, in 2018, the Family First Prevention Services Treatment Act, which is a, uh, which is a mouthful, 
allows states to use child welfare dollars for prevention. Um, it also did a couple of other things around congregate care of kids in custody. But one of the interesting things here is it allows like states to use funds to, to get moms into treatment before they deliver to try to prevent that foster placement. A lot of these things really didn't come with a lot of money. Um, so there have been some investments over time uh, into state child welfare systems. So one of the almost government shutdowns that happened in 2018, there was $60 million invested for plans of safe care. Um, and then in 2018, we saw the Support Act, which was a pretty big piece of legislation focused on the opioid crisis that was far more specific in what a plan of safe care should look like. And, and I'll, I'll link to this. This is the agencies that it specifically highlighted. So who should be involved as a plan of safe care? And this is like, when we're discharging infants home, who should be involved in their plan to make sure they're safe when, when they leave? Uh, so potentially the child welfare agency, substance use disorder treatment agency, early care and education, state Medicaid, public health, residential treatment, judicial system, home nurse visitation, Title V, and IDA Part C. This is TEIS in our state. This is overwhelming. I mean, I don't know what your discharge summaries look like, but ours don't, don't encompass all of this. And, you know, I think this is one of the reasons why states are really struggled with what is the plan of safe care? Who implements the plan of safe care? I think largely we haven't seen this live up to what it could live up to. The other piece is that the Support Act, this, much of this really wasn't funded either. So we're asking states to implement a plan of safe care without a lot of guidance and without a lot of funds to do it. And I think that's really been challenging. Right now, Congress is looking to reauthorize CAPTA. And I think there are, and this again is the landmark, this is like the foundation for where child, uh, child welfare legislation is built on. And um, it changes the language a little bit from a plan of safe care to a family care plan um, to engage families and be a little bit more descriptive about what we're trying to do. Uh, it changes the term affected by and is pretty problematic uh, because it just doesn't have a lot of clinical meaning to, um, to, to and, and specifically they called out infants that withdrawal and fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, which is pretty hard to impossible to, to diagnose at birth, to infants affected by maternal substance use disorder, including alcohol use disorder. So instead of focusing on the infant, we talk about the substance use disorder, which I think is probably more in line with the intent. It allows for agencies outside the child welfare system to engage um, and, uh, and hopefully we'll create some, some grant programs for that too. Why this is important, I think we're asking the child welfare system to do the work of public health. And that's really challenging. We should, uh, the child welfare system needs to keep kids safe. Um, but a lot of what we're trying to, we're asking them to do is like how, yeah, help us with housing, food insecurity. That's really, you know, that really stresses an already stressed and, and underfunded system. So why aren't we leveraging better Title V and maternal child health um, block grant? I, I think, uh, I think the, this legislation provides an opportunity for states to leverage public health systems in ways that they haven't before. So I'm hopeful this will be a positive change and will also come importantly with money to states to do it. The last thing I just wanna talk about is Firefly. This is a program that we launched for pregnant women with opioid use disorder and their infants. And I'll talk a little bit about the care delivery that we do in hospitals and our hospital for infants too. Um, so this is our Firefly team. We just launched, um, this was like that, that rare time where we didn't have to wear masks for like five minutes in between the pandemic. Now we don't meet as a group again, but um, here's our team. And so this is funded by the, the, and I'll talk about this in a second, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation. It gave us a little bit more, a lot more money to, uh, to create a potential optimal model for care delivery. So here pictured are uh, peer recovery specialists, lactation consultants, OBs, psychiatrists, social workers, um, pediatricians, like a pretty broad array of folks working to try to improve care for pregnant women and infants. And so this is, uh, now it looks actually pretty blurry. This is from CMS. This, so CMS, uh, Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, uh, funded nine states um, to, uh, to try to improve care. It's basically a demonstration project. Can we provide better care to families to improve outcomes and save money? Um, and doing this mainly through changing the care delivery structure to break down silos in and out of healthcare and to address social needs. Our program is focused on Middle Tennessee and is initially launching in July, like we just launched a couple months ago, in, based out of Davidson County and will launch in a rural setting uh, in the coming years. Um, and so what does treatment look like for us? Um, it's 
trying to look at the entire continuum. So when a woman comes into treatment, we've now enrolled 65 women since uh, July 1st. Uh, they have a pretty extensive intake process where you can identify needs for food security, transportation, housing, things like that. And then we connect them to addiction treatment based upon their needs. Um, so medication for opioid use disorder, group counseling, uh, soon we'll be starting an inpatient, uh, sorry, an intensive outpatient program uh, for, for counseling. Um, here we have partnerships where we try to be a one-stop shop for um, OB, addiction treatment, psychiatry, infectious disease, pediatrics, all in one spot. In the hospital setting, we have rooming in with uh, mom and baby, um, working on the co a consult process for addiction medicine, the same things I'm gonna talk about in a minute, our care process for infants to um, provide risk appropriate care um, and minimize morphine. And then in that, in that one year postpartum, we're really focused on how do, we, um, how do we provide the resources and treatment to reduce relapse in that period. We know that that's a high time for relapse. About a third of our maternal mortality in the state is related to overdose death. The other piece I'll mention, and I, didn't, I took out slides on hepatitis C because I'm gonna leave some time for discussion, but hepatitis C follow-up. We know in Tennessee, um, there's been a huge increase in hepatitis C among pregnant women, and uh, our systems to follow uh, exposed infants are pretty poor. Um, about 20% of exposed infants actually get tested uh, for, for hepatitis C zero conversion. So that's an important piece. We're gonna, we, we're gonna do our best to sort of follow up. I shouldn't say do our best, we will follow up uh, to make sure infants are, are, are tested. This is all built upon uh, this foundation of peers. These are women with lived experience who have specialized training to guide women through the process. That has been our biggest innovation. And we're working with 10 care as well as the three MCOs that pulled us off. All right, here's the question that we had earlier, which is what are the models of care? And this is what would have changed over the last couple of years. The traditional and common um, models of care for opioid exposed infants is to transfer them to a tertiary care facility, to separate mom and baby with the baby and a pretty loud chaotic NICU, like where many of us were. Um, treatment separate from the mother, breastfeeding is either not allowed or inconsistent, focus a lot on the correct medicine as opposed to the care process. The literature suggests burnout's common. I mean, there's some nurse, good nursing literature about um, burnout among nurses. Um, care not standardized, and we see really long lengths of stay. If you look at the literature, I'm sure many of you have, we see lengths of stay of 100 days, exceedingly long. And you know that's not how long withdrawal lasts in any other population. So it's not clear to me why it should last that long for infants. Um, New care model, models our transfer tertiary care facility may not be necessary. Um, I think that's certainly true for the care of the infant. I think addressing some of the social needs, sometimes um, you know, having the availability of social workers are just not there for critical access hospitals. Uh, keeping the diet intact and out of the NICU when possible. Um, treatments inclusive of the mom, including engaging in scoring. Breastfeeding is encouraged and supportive. Uh, for us, if a mom has been uh, without relapse for 30 days or longer, um, uh, we, uh, we will allow, we, we, will, we will support breastfeeding, I should say. Um, focus on the care process, not, the, not just the medications. Engaging the staff in trauma-informed care, using standardized process and protocols. And for us, our experience has been greater provider satisfaction and patient satisfaction, as well as a pretty big reduction in length of stay. So a lot of this started a couple of years ago in 2017 with Team Hope, and um, we were able to get a small grant from a community foundation to start this. And it was physicians, nurses, social workers, child life specialists, lactation consultants, and volunteers, um, and included OB, neonatology, um, hospital medicine, the newborn nursery. And, uh, and we basically said, how do we do this differently? And at the time, our you know, uh, it care for infants that were opioid exposed were about 10% of our NICU, and we were just tied on space too. And so it was a good time to try to do something different. Um, overall, uh, we've had, we had about 350 infants that are opioid exposed greater than 35 weeks in the last two years. So what we did was take infants that were greater than 35 weeks that didn't have a reason to be in the NICU out of the NICU. And we care for them in the newborn nursery. And I actually think in that time of the newborn nursery, deploy resources there to try to keep the inference from escalating to withdrawal is really important. So there we focused on um, child life specialists for, uh, for mom and baby um, and lactation uh, and the same sort of care provider team so that we could try to do the things to modify the environment, to promote breastfeeding, to promote that bonding time, to keep infants from escalating to needing 
pharmacotherapy. And of course, some infants do. So if infants stay longer um, in, uh, new, than, than we need in the newborn nursery, they don't come to our NICU, they come to our general academic, their general PEDS floor, um, where they're cared for by a pediatric hospitalist. Um, and again, the only reason why they come to the NICU is if there's a, a need, respiratory distress, prematurity, something like that. So here's what we've seen over the last few years. Um, rooming in, we've been uh, pretty successful with that. 97% uh, were rooming in. 70% um, of eligible moms were still providing breast milk at the time of discharge. Uh, we also created a discharge checklist to make sure we're doing some of the things like referral for hepatitis C, referral to early intervention services, making a pediatrician follow-up appointment. Um, we've done a better job with that. About 90% of our infants were discharged home with their biological mother. The interesting thing here is we see a big difference between moms in treatment, of course, and then moms who are not in treatment. Getting moms into treatment appears to help reduce foster care placement. And then two infants we've seen uh, readmitted within seven days of discharge. So overall, our median length of stay for all comers is five days, 11 days if they receive one or more doses of morphine. Um, that's, that's a lot less than what we were doing before uh, when we were in the low 20s in terms of our length of stay for infants diagnosed with uh, drug withdrawal. And I'll say this, you know, I'm, I've talked a lot about not forgetting about the infants who are exposed, but don't have drug withdrawal. We, we did a pretty poor job of that before we started this. So comparing where we were before 2017 to now is a little bit difficult because we don't have the entire universe of opioid exposed infants readily available. Okay, I'm talking a lot uh, and fast and uh, with a lot of caffeine on board. Um, but uh, to conclude, pregnant women infants have been pretty substantially affected by the opioid crisis. And our approaches really do need to be tailored and addressing their specific needs. I think one of the things that we see is that pregnant women and infants are, are oftentimes forgotten to talk about the opioid crisis. Um, and I hope that's not true when we think about opioid settlement dollars and dollars and things like that too as we move forward. Improving outcomes begins before birth, including connection to treatment. I, I think that's really important for, for pregnant women if we can identify them. Um, this isn't about drug use, it's also about the community, economic opportunity, social networks and trauma. I'm really hopeful that the opioid crisis is gonna be a vehicle to improve maternal child health systems. Um, I've seen it locally for us. I've seen it in other communities where this has been a vehicle to galvanize groups that oftentimes don't talk um, and that are siloed in communities where we can bring together our, you know, our, our churches, our, uh, our hospitals, our, um, our child welfare system. Um, I, I think there's a lot of hope for how this may uh, be a vehicle for how we can tackle other problems that are related to maternal child health. Uh, a lot of folks to thank here at Vanderbilt, other collaborators at other, um, other institutions, and of course our funders, primarily the National Institute on uh, Drug Abuse. And I look forward to taking your questions. If you wanna know a little bit more about our work too, our um, center's website is childpolicy.org, and then Firefly is fireflytn.org. And look forward to chatting. Thanks for an amazing presentation, Dr. Patrick. Um, I think we'll open the floor to questions. Dr. Patrick, um, Lauren Swift again, hi. Um, so we, uh, as a hospice group, are trying to transition these babies um, into onto our service away from the ICU, which it sounds like you guys have been doing for a couple of years now. And currently our babies that are just being observed for NAS or for NALS, we watch them in the nursery, they room and we do all that. We do that kind of the five day watch. And so transitioning the ones that require more treatment, I guess is what we're planning on doing after the surge ends. <laughs> so one question I have for you, we've met, we have an addiction medicine fellowship here at ETSU. And so we've met with their program director about involving their fellows in the care of this population, because it is more about just the baby, it's the mom and the, like everything you just talked about. Do you guys use addiction medicine specialists in the hospital with these babies or how are they incorporated into your teams? We haven't. I mean, I will say that like our, you know, the, the medical lead for the medical director for Firefly is boarded in obstetrics and addiction medicine. Um, addiction medicine fellowship that's starting here is in, is in internal medicine. Thus far, we've not integrated that uh, into our care processes, but we've, we've certainly talked about it. Um, and I think it's a need probably for, for addiction medicine uh, folks. 
uh, and particularly those folks that maybe med peds trained. Um, and I think it's a particularly really good uh, uh, opportunity to, to, to see that scope of, of training. So I, I think it's a great idea, but it's not something we've, we've implemented here yet. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Are the fireworks still happening every year? And is it still amazing? Yes. <laughs> I think I was like eight or nine. And so, you know, when you're eight or nine, you look up and everything is kind of amazing. Yeah. Um, uh, as far as trying to coordinate all these other agencies, like you said, it's really a lot about kind of the social setup for moms and really connecting her to make sure that she's most successful in um, kind of being in society. What, and like you said, a big barrier is not having funding. What, what sort of pieces do you all do to try and make those connections with say churches or community agencies or schools? So those are things that we're really just embarking on. Um, and our, you know, one of the things that we launched when we started Fireflies, we had a, a little more than a year to plan. We started an external advisory committee. Um, these are folks who volunteer to, to be on to help advise us on how to connect. And that includes, we, we, well, the, the, we, we pay the, the women in recovery, but we have four women in recovery. We have the courts, DCS, um, early intervention, Head Start, um, to have those conversations about how can we how can we do a better job of connecting folks to those resources? Um, just having those conversations and having like an intentional space has made us aware of resources that we didn't know about. Um, I do think this is a challenging space because, I mean, especially now, we're all we're all operating at sort of maximum capacity. And then you say, all right, well, also coordinate this. I think that's really challenging. So what my hope is, is that models like we're doing that are funded by CMS will hopefully be able to be scaled. Because one of the things we found as we got this influx of funding from CMS, we're able to hire peer recovery specialists who have a completely different experience of you know, how to engage with the community, where, you know, how to connect with women, how to sort of plug in. So I, I, for me, I think that that is a critical, it, it appears to be a critical step. We've done a lot of process mapping to try to understand where we can connect. And the other group that you could consider that is um, that is that is free are the case management, um, the case management programs within the three Medicaid managed care organizations. So what we've been working to do is try to harmonize what we're doing with the case management systems within the MCOs. That's free, and leveraging that I think could be beneficial. Even in our even before we started this, some of the some of the uh, uh, MCOs were sending their case management folks in person to clinic. Um, to address. So that, that may be one resource um, to, to dive into. Um, but I, I think it's incredibly challenging. I also think the piece of this is that I, I'm really hopeful that CAPTA and what we see in terms of like pushing forward towards public health is that the responsibility will be, you know, will be on, you know, public health and on folks outside of the healthcare setting to help us with that. Because I think uh, I think we have a role, but I think defining having folks define what our role is is really important. Again, particularly in a pretty in pretty chaotic clinical environments, I think that needs to be clear, and it just really hasn't been clear thus far. Great, it's certainly a work in progress. It is. You think we would have solved it as far as the opioid crisis, but but we haven't just yet. I see Dr. Pure, who leads our Baby Steps Clinic. Um, um, so hi, I'm Diana Pure. I'm one of the general pediatricians um, and work in the Baby Steps Clinic, which is following kiddos zero through five who have been prenatally substance exposed. Um, and so we do, a, we have an interdisciplinary team, um, a large team and work with Tennessee Early Intervention and um, with some substance abuse counseling um, and trying just to really wrap around the developmental needs of the child as well as trying to prevent return to use, relapse, um, and really work around looking at the whole family unit. Um, 
So I think one of the questions is, um, how did you get the that money to start Firefly? How did you start that process? Because um, money is, um, yes, in short supply. And I feel like as we've been doing this for um, a year, year and a half now, we've learned a lot in the process. And um, one of the big things is just how to support the moms more. And so I think peer recovery um, would be fabulous and just how, you know, how to get more in-home services and more peer recovery support and all those kinds of things. And so we're looking at lots of different ways of doing that and trying to be resourceful. Um, but yes, money is always an issue, right? And what's interesting is like, even with money, like I, the, <laughs> this has still been challenging, right? Even with resources, figuring out how to navigate these the spaces is challenging both within the institution and outside. So for us, there was a, you know, CMS had a call, like they put out like, hey, we're going to do a month, we're going to do, it's called the mom model. We're going to do this model focused on pregnant women with opioid use disorder. And because it's, it's the, the kind of resource-based friend, we responded to it and we were fortunate enough to, to get it. Um, so that was a, that was a one-off. But honestly, there are oftentimes, um, we should just keep talking, right? Uh, there are oftentimes funding opportunities from HRSA, from other places um, that, that can begin to pull things together. HRSA has something now focused on NAS. Uh, there's a funding opportunity uh, that I'm, I'm failing to remember what it is, that they will oftentimes, um, if, if you're in a designated county uh, of need, that they will provide resources for some of this cross-disciplinary work that oftentimes will also, for some counties, have also included peer recovery specialists. So um, I'm happy to, to look and connect. Um, funding is there. It's really hard to find. And even as things have come out, there's this patchwork of like, various grant programs that are time limited and it's not, it's, you have to, they, they happen quickly and it's been hard for us to respond. So, um, so I, I agree with you, this is challenging, but it's amazing work that you guys are doing. Well, and thank you for the talk. It was a wonderful talk. Um, and as far as the, the grant, I have to defer to Dr. Spitzina. She's our, she's our grant guru. So I just work clinically in the clinic and then she tries to find the money for us to bring you know all these team members together so and i'm at home sorry you can see our we had a birthday recently happy birthday. I, happy birthday. Happy birthday. <laughs> I was trying hard not to turn my video on but then you know <laughs> usually I, i'm at when i'm at home there's a dog barking somewhere in the background but thank you very much you got it well it's been great to be with you all today and i you know hopefully sometime in the, in the future we can uh, we can all be back in person, um, maybe with fireworks. Yes, this was amazing. Thank you so much, Dr. Patrick, and we'll be in touch. We would love to continue the conversation. Great to see you all. Have a good rest of your day. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye.